Welcome back to the chess game. Today we're focusing on two things. First thing is to restore the game as it was prior. And the second thing is to um, start the game if we have two players around. So we're going to have cameras in there. We are going to have multiplayer messages, two new messages. And we're going to be restoring the local game. So let me give you a look at what this is. When we click on online game, yes, we can host. Same thing as before. But now when we connect, we are assigned a team and the camera flies to that very specific team. So for example here, this is the second team and this guy has the white team. We can then uh, move things, but we still can't receive those moves. That's gonna be for next episode. We also don't know one more thing, and that thing is to restore the local game. So now with the multiplayer code engine running behind this, we are still able to play locally. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section down below and uh, see you there. Cheers. All right, guys, today our goal will be to make sure a game starts. So it's a very simple thing we're gonna do today. We're gonna do two messages, I believe. One for welcoming a guest that joins your game and also one for starting a game. So what I'm thinking here is that as a, a player that connects, I'm going to send a welcome message to the server and that server will reply with the same message, but he will reply it to a certain client, just one client. And um, that client will receive a team ID. So he will know if he's team zero or team one in that case. So we're going to start right away by creating this new message. And this is how we create all message from now on. So creating a new net welcome in this case. Um, I don't want you to confuse this with start game. It's going to be a bit different. Think it as this as some sort of we're joining a lobby and then when the lobby is full, we launch immediately. So in that net welcome message, I will go ahead, open up Visual Studio and we will make sure we inherit from net message. So every time we inherit from net message, we have to do a couple of things. So we have to create two constructor, as you guys remember, um, here they are. So those are our two constructor. We first start by creating a net welcome message. When we do a, a typical new net welcome, this is what will happen. Uh, the operation code is welcome. If you guys don't remember, we've made the list inside of our net utility. We had the keep live, the welcome start game, and these other message we still haven't made yet. This is there. Uh, data stream reader, we will need to include the Unity networking transport for that to happen. So quick recap, this is when you actually send the message. And this is when you receive it. Why? Because here it's a brand new message that you create. Then you're going to fill in the information uh, on the spot if you need it. And then here is when you receive the box and you still don't know what is inside of it. So you have to use stream reader to deserialize the thing, which means that we're going to need a specific deserialize. Um, last time we've done something with the net keep alive, we actually didn't deserialize anything and we just serialized the code. Why? Because we didn't have any information, but this time around, the net welcome will carry on information. That information is going to be a simple int. Oh. And that int will be for the assign team. And I'll make that a property. That's why I put a capital letter in there. So with that in mind, we've done the first out of three parts of creating a new message. So we define the constructor and also the data that's going to be inside of that message. The second part will be to override the serialize and also deserialize. And we do it this way. So public override serialize with a reference to the box we're writing in. We write in the code. So that's our operation code. And then right after that, we write the int. So do notice that you really have to notice here that the um, the function name has changed to write int instead of write byte. And this is so very important for you guys to understand. If you put an int in the box, it has to be write int. If you put a boolean, it has to be a boolean. Um, and if you put a fixed string, it has to be a string with a certain fixed amount of character, you could say. Now, why is that? Because when, when you receive this box and you want to read it, you have to read it in the same order as it was packaged, else you are going to run into some data corruption issues. What do I mean by that? Well, when you actually read it, you first have to do read byte, and then you then have to do uh, read int. If you guys remember here, we already read the byte in the on 
data net utility on data so our byte is already read for all the message we do and then here we just read the rest in the same order as it was written so assign team read end not read byte not read string just a read end okay that's our second part done and then the third part has to be with receive on client and receive on server so when we receive this on the server on the, on the client I am going to call this function of course as always we put the uh, the question mark in case nobody's listening we don't want to invoke this but if one person at least or one script is listening we invoke this function if we receive it on the server same thing but this time around we send who it is from there we go okay so we got that out of the way that is our net welcome message now this net welcome message will be sent from the client initially so it will be sent as a empty um, empty message here assign team we're gonna leave it on on zero the server does not need to know what is your assigned team the purpose of that the reason why the server does not need to know who is your assigned team is because you're the client and you don't technically know that information and we're not gonna allow any input from you so as a server I will assign you a team and the client will have no say in that basically so going on inside of my client right now what I'm going to do is go over to when I connect so when I connect to um, the server as a client I'm going to send a new message a new net welcome and as I've mentioned earlier we don't have to do something of the sort so here is what we would do if we wanted to send information to the server we would do something like that so a new net welcome then s dot assign team is equal to five and then we would send this message uh, not what I'm looking to do here I actually don't care about the value of the net welcome so here we go all right so at this point the message is still not being well it, it is being sent but it is not actually being recognized properly and that's because we're missing one last step uh, with the message and that would have to be with the net utility let's go back in the unity uh, in the utility I'm sorry uh, and actually uncomment the operation code welcome so earlier without this basically what would happen is that yes the message would be sent yes the proper information was inside of it but if it didn't go through this switch statement we would not know how to interpret that message we would just be reading a bunch of byte array and 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 just yes we would have the operation code but we would not understand how to decode it when it goes through this it actually knows to decode it in this very specific pattern right so we send in the net welcome with the stream this one calls deserialize with this deserialize we know the order in which those fields are being set okay I know I'm taking a lot of time to explain but this is information that is crucial to the understanding of the whole system okay so now at that point we can finally say that the message is being sent and here is where we have to listen for it so the message is being sent only to the server and not to the other client so the server has to be listening for this and thanks to the the whole system we've made over here with the net utility taking care of firing events so when we receive a message basically we fire an event so receive on server thanks to that whole system we don't have to be writing the code inside of server.cs actually I think we're actually done with server.cs for pretty much the whole tutorial I believe so I'm just gonna collapse it and um, and what happens at this point is that we can just listen to certain events in any script that we wish because this is of course a singleton so here's what we'll do we'll go inside of our famous checkboard or oh, sorry chessboard not checkboard our chessboard.cs our biggest script from the last tutorial the last two tutorial actually and we're going to go to the awake statement and we're going to start listening for certain events something that I like to do an actual pattern I like to do here uh, just to make sure it's not too too cumbersome over here is to write a function called register events just like we've done earlier and this register event I'm taking it all the way to the bottom of the script so right here and I actually make a region for it that's how I split my code of course uh, it's a personal preference and you can split it the way you wish but that's how we do it this one can also be private because the only person who needs to call this is ourself the uh, the checkboard on awake 
And finally, regist unregister events is also, they, they come in a group together basically. So you register the events and if you shut down this object, if you destroy it, I don't want to have um, any events being taken care of on a dead object, a, a, an object that doesn't have any reference anymore. So it's very important that we also uh, make sure to get rid of those events if we get rid of the object. Okay, so is that being called in the awake? Yes, it is. We can now start registering events. Those events are going to be the message event that I've discussed earlier. So here we have to listen for the welcome message. So here's what we do. Net utility. We have to listen as a server because we're sending the information from the client. So we have to listen as a server over here. And we're not listening for keep live. We don't really care about that. That's being taken care of on the server. We have to listen for the welcome message. And when that message comes, we call a function called on welcome server, for example, this could be it. I'm going to generate this method just right here and I'm gonna move it down this way. So here's what I plan on doing. At the top, register events, on register events, and then all the message uh, being parsed by the server would be here. And I'm also gonna have a section for messages being parsed by the client. All right. So this is what we get every time we um, we parse a message from the server. We get a net message argument, that would be our message, and we also get the network connection it is from, so CNN could do the job. Well, our goal over here will be to actually assign a team to that message and send it back to the client. So client has connected, assign a team and return the message back to him. We have everything we need to do that right here. So the first thing I'll do is I'll actually change the type of my message. We didn't have to do that for the keep alive because we were not writing any value in it. But this time around, we are writing value in it. We're actually writing the int, the only int in there. So second step will be to assign a team. And here, I still don't know what it's gonna be. So I'm just gonna input minus one for the moment. We're gonna come back to that very, very fast. Actually, do we have values for player account? No, we don't. So we're gonna make sure to come back to that in a second. And finally, we'll need to return that back to the client. How do we do that? By calling the server instance, send to client. And as mentioned earlier, we have everything we need. We have the connection and we have the message. In this case, don't send in message we have to send in the new message we've made, so the net welcome message. Why? Because it's the one that has the information inside of it, so the assigned team information. Okay, here we're missing the, the that one part. That one part is basically what is gonna be our team. And to make sure I know what the team is, I'm going to keep track of it at the very top of the script. So here in our logic, I'll do a private int for player count. Now, since I'm here, I'm also going to do something else. So this value would be only for the server to, to care about that, right? So if we are the client and we join second, um, this int would be two, you could say. Uh, but what I care about here is two values. What is my current team and also how many player is there? So, so that value is going to be useful for the server and this one will be useful for both the server and the client. So I'll keep that here. And I'm also going to add a small comment over here just to help me understand that those values are for the multiplayer logic. Okay, going back down over here, we start at minus one, right? So here at the player count, we start at minus one. This is also a way to tell us that, hey, you know, nobody has joined yet. When somebody joins, I am going to say plus plus player count. Why do I do it this way? Well, because I want to increment the player count, but before the team is assigned, I want to increment that value. So the first time this is ran, knowing that player count is minus one, it's going to do plus plus first before assigning that value. So the first assigned team is going to be zero or the white team in this case. That's good because as a host, we, yes, we start a game, um, we, we start a server, but as a host, we also start a client. So immediately after starting the server, a client will connect. So ourself will connect. We will send a welcome message to the same computer because the same computer is running the server. And that one will assign the zero team to the player, to us, and we'll send it back to the client. Okay. All right, so we have this right here. This message or this function is only parsed on the server side. But what happens 
for the client. Well, the same exact thing actually, and we do it in the same exact script. So the same flow applies, um, and however, it goes through in other events. So it looks a little bit like this. We're going to do it in the same exact script. So that's, that's the cool part about this. Notice the difference. Here we receive it on the client, and here we receive it on the server. And I'm going to call the function the exact same, but change, of course, server to client. Generate it, cut, paste it right here. And here we go. Also change the message over here. So at this point, the message we receive should be a net welcome message and it should have the information. So it's going to be important for us to unpack this box and say, um, let's, let's just receive the connection message. We're going to do net welcome NW is equal to message as net welcome. And finally assign the team. So we're going to say current team is going to be equal to net welcome assigned team. And the information isn't there because we just deserialized this thing um, earlier in the process. Let's take a quick break and actually test this out. So I'm going to say debug.log and I'll do um, boop, boop, boop. my assigned team is and just send in that information. Okay. To see this message, well, first we're going to give it a try over here. So we're going to just boot the game and host the game as well. Oh, I have a maximize and play. I'm sorry about that. So as I click on the host, we're connected and my assigned team is zero. Now what I'm quickly going to do is I'm going to launch a build of this and I'll host on the, um, the build and I'll try to connect directly from the editor. This way we can see that uh, the client, the, the client without a server on it would be connecting and then in the console, we should be seeing my assigned team is one. Or at least that is the expected result. So here I've launched the host and I'm gonna connect. And my assigned team is one and I'm not receiving the other message for my assigned team is zero. All right, so we've got it. So congratulations, we have a successful message going through the pipeline completely. We create it, we send it, and we receive it back. So it's like a, it's like a request into the server does something and sends us back the information. It's quite a feat, believe it or not. Um, our next step will be to actually start the game. So what I'm going to do with start game is just going to be another message with no information on, on the message. And if we reach two player, which is maximum for chess, then we're going to broadcast that message over. And you know what? I'll be doing it right here in this event. So when we receive the welcome message, assuming that we now have two players, so we can actually find this information right here through the player account. So if we have two player, we are going to go ahead and, um, and launch the team. So here's what I'll do. If my assigned team, or you could say my player account in this case. So if my player account is equal to one because we have the player zero and we have player one. So if the, the player black joins basically, let's start the game. A full start the game. How are we gonna start the game? We're gonna do it by broadcasting a new message. So server instance broadcast and it's gonna be a new net start game. So a brand new message that we have to go ahead and create. You know what? We don't need that, okay. So let's go back to our drawing board. Let's create a new message. Net start game. As I've mentioned earlier, this one is not going to contain any information on um, inside of it. So it's going to be a quite simple one. And what I'll do over here is I'll just grab whatever I have in the net welcome and we'll do it quite fast. I'm just going to copy that, paste it here. Net start game remove the field we don't need that field change the operation code for start game we are not serializing any field because we don't have any same thing for deserialize and we're changing very important we change this event for c start game and s start game as well and just like that we have a brand new message we can close this one off and we're already done with it 
Oh, and I forgot our last step when we uh, create a message is to open up the net utility and on comment this one. So here's a brand new message going through our pipeline. And then what we're going to be doing is opening up the chessboard because this one is going to be one is going to be the, the script listening for those messages. So who actually cares about this one? Um, the server is the one that will be sending it. So the server will be sending a net start game because he's the one that, uh, you know, on the welcome server, he's the one that launched it over here. The information needs to be received on the client side for sure. And actually it only has to be received on the client side. So the start game message does not need to be sent back. Um, that being said, C start game plus equal on start game client. Um, usually in my, in my um, survival multiplayer game, I don't input client or server at the end, but since I'm having events on both sides this time here, um, I do that and maybe I'll, I'll go and I'll do that forward as well for my multiplayer game. But at the moment, here's what I'll do. I'll put this function, the on start game client, I'll put it down here and we'll need to do something. We'll need to actually launch the game. And now here's a small caveat. The game is already started. It's already running in the background and it always has been. The only difference now is that we don't see it because the camera is not at the right place. So here, we just need to change the camera actually, which brings us to the final part of this video in which we are going to be just moving the camera around a simple, a simple task, but a task that is much needed. And um, most of my logic regarding that will be done inside of the game UI actually. So let me collapse everything, make some space. And what I'll do here is I'll create a new serialized field of game objects. So game objects array and call them camera angles. Now, some of you might know what I'm about to do with this because it's a game object array and not a transform array. I'm actually about to install the uh, Cine Machine, actually make this quite, quite simple with Cine Machine. Before I do so, I'll actually put a name to all the camera angles we're going to have. So I'll do a public enum for all the camera angles, just to help us keep track of them. One of them is going to be for the menu. One of them is going to be for the white team. And the other one will be for the black theme like this. All right. We'll put that on hold for the moment and we will go ahead and install the machine, which should be very, very fast. So opening up the package manager, sometimes it opens, sometimes it doesn't. There it is. I'll be installing the Cine machine package. Do note, if you don't want to have Cine machine, what we could do instead is get a reference to all the transform and just make sure that we take our camera, our camera dot main and make it match the exact same position as those camera angles. This is possible. What I'm going to do instead here is I'm going to have a uh, different game objects that will hold the position, but they will also have, they will also hold a um, virtual camera from Cine Machine, which will help us go from one place to another. So that being said, I am going to create myself a new empty game object, make sure it is centered and I'll call them cameras. It's empty. Now I'll create a virtual camera with Cine Machine, put it under cameras. And this one will need to point toward our chessboard, or actually our menu would be good in this case. So I'm going to open up a small window here for uh, my game view so I can actually see what goes on. And let's angle this in a certain way where it doesn't see. So maybe, oh, it's hard with a white background, but what I'll do is I'll just rotate it this way. So minus 90 degrees. Let's see how it looks like in the game. Yeah, so we don't see anything here. Um, so minus, minus 90 degree would be good. And then when we say, we look at the black team, we just rotate the camera, something like that, <laughs> but uh, with more precision. <laughs> okay, so that's gonna be the menu camera. Um, next up, I'll copy and paste this one. This is gonna be the white theme. And to make sure I have the proper value, I'll just go ahead and I'll um, go inside of the game, actually position this properly. So maybe something like that using control shift F to move my camera. And I'm also going to be disabling the menu one so I can see how it looks like. 
Yep, and then all we have to do is actually polish those value so we have some nice round numbers. It's something I actually like doing quite a lot. So I'm thinking something roughly roughly like that. Maybe the angle's a little bit too steep, yeah. Yeah, that could do. So minus 3.5. Perfect. Once we have the um oh, minus 4. Once we have the value that we want, I'm going to copy this before I exit the play mode, shut this down and then paste my value back. And that is our white team. Copy that over for black team this time. And we're just going to invert that. So I'm going to be rotating this 180 degrees and just moving that to 4, I believe. Yeah. All right. So this seems to be the way we're going to be doing things right here. Um, what else do we need? We would need to find a canvas and actually input the camera angle. So these three camera angles, I'll add them here in the array. Zero is going to be menu, one will be white team, and two will be the black team. Okay, our final piece of work with this will have to do with, well, first, here's what we'll do. Um, we'll make sure the menu one has priority. So I'll put that on, say, 15, and the rest are on 10. Our final piece of work, I was going to say, is, is with the code. We have to make this work in the code as well. Um, this will only require a very simple function that will create roughly around here. This is for the cameras. And it's going to be a function called change camera. What we do is we go through all the camera in the array and then we set them to false. We then only enable the one that we need. And this is being defined by the camera angle index. With this new line of code, we are now going to go back on the chessboard in our start game message right here and we're just going to tell our game UI to change the camera angle depending on what is our team. So do know that we have the team. We know what the team is because earlier we set it directly here in current team. So we're going to do instance change camera and depending on our current team. So if current team is equal equal to zero, then we go to white. And if it's not, then we're going to go to black. So let's wrap this up this way in a ternary operator. This is for white team else it's going to be for the black team. Okay, so we wrote a lot of code. It's time to test this out. So the way it is being set up right now, we messed up our single player. However, we got the multiplayer to work. That's why I have to do a build to test things out. Don't worry, we'll return back to making the, um, the single player work in just a bit. Okay, so starting the game over here, whomever is the host will be uh, team ID zero. So let's, let's say this one is going to be the host. He's waiting for connection. We're going to be connecting to him through localhost. And this guy should be headed to the black side. Here you go. And this one should be on the white side. And here it is. So everything seems to work, except of course, we have these button here in the middle of the screen, which we're going to disregard for the moment. Let's assume it's not there. And as I am selecting the black team here, I can't, but I can move the white team. What happens on this side? I can also move the white team. So here we have a problem regarding that. So we have two massive problems right now. First, the, the UI is in the screen. And second, both player could move the white pawn. Um, so what problem should we be addressing first? We're going to be addressing the UI in the middle of the screen first. And there is two ways to go about this problem. I'll let you choose which one you want, but I'll actually force one up to you. <laughs> I actually won't let you choose, but um, it, it's really up to you. There, there's two ways to go about it. And let me explain what they are. So this is our game UI script. We have to, to remove the UI. And the way we're going to do that is by moving the menu animator. Now, what we could do is when we launch the game right here, we could simply say game UI dot instance, um, get a reference with the animator and just say change to what was it already so change to game set trigger game uh or in-game menu i believe yeah so we could do that line from this piece of code but it gets a little bit unclean it's it's a little bit spaghetti and we don't really want that the option i wanted to go for instead is the following I want the game UI to be listening for messages as well. 
So I would rather take option number two, which has to do with listening for the message. So going with the exact same way we've done it earlier, I'm just going to go up here, grab the register events, and also grab the actual register event. Where is it at? Here it is. These two inside of the region grab them and also include them inside of my script. And now this script will be listening for network event as well, which is what I am going for. Um, we're listening for on start game for the client. So I'll just leave this one in there and I'll generate the function, put it down here, keep it exactly the same as it was before. And I don't think I've done that earlier, but we also have to unregister in some, in, in case something happens, we'll have the option to do so right here. Okay. And when the game starts, the function I wanted to do was just take the animator. I believe it was the game animator. What was the name of this animator? Actually, <laughs> menu animator, here it is. Menu animator dot set trigger to, I also forgot what was the trigger. So it was uh, in game menu, here it is. Sorry about that, okay. So that's all I want to do. Now I know that we actually wrote two new function three new function called two mute new events and also have a new call in our awake. Uh, that's a lot of code when we could just have done something of the sort, right? So we, just, we could have done something like that instead. Uh, and that would have worked just fine, uh, assuming this one was public. But instead of doing that, we went the long route because we want things to be a little bit consistent, at least on my end. So I'd rather have this and be able to read it in the same exact way and know what, what happens, you know, when a message is being sent, then have it the other way around and have a little bit more spaghetti. So up to you. This is what I like the best. Okay. Um, I am not going to, to, to actually test this out just yet. We'll test it out at the same time as we test out the uh, moving from the other team. The moving from the other team would actually be dealt with under the chessboard. So as we are under the chessboard, we have an option to pick up pawns in the, in the update function. So inside of the update function, roughly over here, that is our condition we have to check for. So is it our turn? So this thing actually changes just a tiny bit and it's roughly around here. So is it the white turn? Yes. Is it uh, a piece that is from the white team? Yes. But both team right now, if it's the white turn, they're allowed to play. That is not what we want to do. Instead, we want to say, is it the white turn? And are we the white team? So is current team equal equal to zero? With this, only the white player will be able to, to move the white um, the white pawn or the white anything really. So same thing here on this side, if it is not the white turn and we are current team one, so we are the black team, then we can move the block pawns, which will mean that I believe we fix pretty much all we have to fix for today's episode, except the single player game. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll get into that. All right. So let's check this out. This time around, we're going to be hosting from the editor. Why not? Let's host, connect. The UI is gone. We have the proper camera angle. And as the black player, I can't move those pawns. I can't move the white team at all. As the white player, I can't move the black, but I can finally move these. Now, unfortunately, we won't be able to test out moving the black for the sole purpose that this team the, the, the black team doesn't know we've made a move. It's not something that is part of our code just yet. So they don't know we've made a move and that's completely fine. It's something we'll do in the next episode. But before I go any further, um, we, we want to do one more thing before we wrap up this episode. I know those episodes are quite longer than I expected in the first place. We could have made a lot more episodes, but you know what? Let's keep it short. Um, what I wanted to do is make sure we fix the single player. So when we press on local game right now, this is what happens nothing because yes we are connected and yes we receive a assigned team so we are team zero but we're, we're still technically waiting for the black player to join now to keep track of whether or not we're playing in a local game or in an online game we're gonna be um we're gonna be doing that inside of a chessboard so we'll be keeping a boolean value inside of the chessboard 
To do so, I will go at my small multiplayer section we've made earlier, right around here, create a new private boolean called local game. Um, I could assign a default value for the moment, let's put it on true, but I actually we have to set that every time, so. Um, what is going to happen next is we have to somehow assign this value from the other script, um, from game UI actually, because game UI is the one that will be saying, hey, we're clicking on local game or online game. So we have to do that from these buttons inside of this script, but I'd rather keep this this here private um, because if I don't keep this private, well, if, if I try to expose this script, I'm going to have to make this script either a reference inside of the game UI or a singleton or something like that, and I'd rather not do that. So instead what I'll do is I'll just subscribe to a certain event and I will be listening for that event. So you do realize I swapped over to a lot of event-based stuff and it's just the way I code now. I don't know if it's going to last forever, but I think things are much cleaner sometimes. Um, here's what I'll do. So inside of my game UI, I will create a new action. That action will contain a boolean. So public action boolean and let's call it local game or is or actually you know what? Set set local game would be good. Um, if it's on through, we're on through, and if it's false, it's false. These action will be triggered first inside of the local button, so roughly around here after we change the menu before we launch these things, I believe. Set local game invoke true. Another place where we have to change this is when we connect to um, to somebody. So on online connect button and also on online host button. So both of these set local game to false because we're no longer a local game. We are now a multiplayer game here and there. And all I have to do from this point on is listen to this very specific event because this one has a, a public instance so we can access this without any issue. Let's go back on the chessboard under my register event. See, it's coming in quite handy at this point, right? Uh, under the register event, I'm going to go down here. This is not related to multiplayer, so I'm just going to put it aside. And I'm going to say game UI instance is local game. Uh, actually, set local game. Call this on set local game. Take this function, generate it. Copy this code over somewhere else. So in this section, and here I'm gonna do local game is equal to uh, my value. I'll just call it v in this case. Okay. Something I haven't done earlier. Let's just take all of these and make sure we unregister if something happens in the future. So same thing, copy paste. Just change the plus equal to minus equal, and we are then we're set. All right, so now that we have our local game value and it is actually being set on the right thing, we're gonna head down to where we welcome our player and we assign the team. So roughly around here at the bottom, I'll say if we are a local game and on top of that, we are team zero, I believe. So if we are a local game and we're the white player or the first player in that matter, uh, let's go ahead and start the game, right? So we're gonna do should we do client or should we do server? Oh, here we're the server, right? So server instance send, actually not send, but broadcast. Hmm, technically we could also just send because we're a single player, but that's all. Let, let's do a broadcast instead. There's only one player connected anyway. Uh, it's gonna be a new net start game message like that. And I believe just like that, we should now have what we want. There is one problem, however, and that's when we swap turns. Um, when we swap turns, the new code that we wrote earlier, so over here, this is going to mess us over because we only have one current team. So when we swap turn, we also have to swap the current team. So I believe we have a function called next turn, I believe, or no, turn is white turn. So is white turn. Let's find this value where we swap it over. We swap it under, I believe this is move to the function. Yeah, under move to, where we swap this turn to is not white turn. 
actually not in set, but below that, we're going to say if we are a local game, then our current team is going to be equal to, well, if we're zero, our current team is going to be equal to the uh, one else zero. So we're just swapping this value in between uh, zero and one. So if it's zero, it goes to one. If it's one, it goes to zero. And if we don't have any error, this should have restored our local game. Oh, and we do have an error. So what is up with this one? Game UI instance was not found, probably because this uh, chessboard awake was run before the game UI, which is not correct. It should be run after. What we could do is we could change the, uh, the script order or we could just change the chessboard to be run on the start instead. So I'm going to go with the easy solution, put that on start. It's not really recommended to change the script execution order. Um, I've heard many people say that. I still haven't investigated why. If you know, please let me know in the comment section down below. Okay, so let's hit local game. We're connected. We only have one assigned team, which is fine. We're not allowed to move the black team. We are, however, allowed to move this one. We did one move, can't move the white team anymore, but we can then move the black team. So everything seems to be working. All right, so we've managed to restore the local game for our multiplayer game. And we've done that by simulating that we were two player at once, basically. Uh, so it's still going through the multiplayer code. And from that point on, everything's gonna be using the multiplayer code, even though you are the same person, right? So if you're both, both player at the same time, we're still gonna be using the multiplayer code. And um, we're missing the one part that is really important and that's when you do a move on one side it has to be replicated on the other side so in the next episode we're going to be doing the move to message which is the biggest one but it's also one of the um it's a very simple one actually it, it's it's going to fit in our code quite well so i do invite you to look at that in the next episode hope you guys enjoyed hope you learned something and if you did please drop me a like i would appreciate that quite a lot and i will see you in the next one cheers